Why did John leave the party? He was worried about Susan. Does it say that? John drove home immediately. Does it say John was worried about Susan? No, we all immediately infer from what we know that, of course, his daughter, somebody claims to have kidnapped his daughter, so of course he's worried. Sorry? Wife's hysterical. Yeah, he may be worried about his wife as well. <laughs> Why was he worried about Susan? Susan was kidnapped. What happened to John at the party? He got a call from Mary. It doesn't say that he got a call from Mary. It says he was called to the phone. It was his wife, Mary. It doesn't say... <laughs> so the, the program is having to fill in the blanks, in a sense, that all these things that we take for granted that are implicit in the meaning of the sentences. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, don't give me this. Don't give me this. Goodbye. Um, there we go. So, uh, and it goes on and on with examples like this. This is called natural language understanding. This is a fairly old system. Um, and you can see that in order to write a program that performs at a, at a high level like this, you're going to have to encode knowledge somehow about the world. So that's what this part of the course is all about, like I was saying last time, uh, knowledge representation. How do we write down the stuff that's true about the world in a way that the computer can make inferences with it and draw new conclusions? So I, I think natural language understanding is just a prime killer app for, for knowledge representation. So, uh, there are folks who feel that when you have the opportunity to do some knowledge engineering before your system is shown some text, maybe you have the chance to rig things up just so things happen to just work. Uh, there are people who feel that way. I might be one of them. I might not. I still think it's impressive performance. Um, it's a good question, though. Evaluation. How do you evaluate a natural language processing system? Turing said, for the Turing test, you can talk about anything you want. And, the end res and, and when they actually held a Turing test down in Boston, they restricted the topic. So they had one session that was just about Shakespeare. And during that session, so a uh, human was talking with someone over a teletype, and they couldn't tell whether the someone on the other end was a human someone or a computer. The end result was that they thought that Marjorie Garber, a professor of English at Harvard, must be a computer because she could quote from Shakespeare at length, verbatim, very quickly, in a way that obviously no human could ever do. So, so how do you evaluate systems? That's an absolutely uh, an appropriate question. Um, this system was, is, is an older system and it is, it is from the knowledge engineering tradition where you encode lots of knowledge and um, those systems are criticized as being brittle. Maybe they know a lot about one domain. Maybe this system knows all about parties and beer and if you tell it that um, there was a terrorist attack, it would not have a clue what that meant. But just the way, like, like uh, if you have kids that grow up in a certain culture and then they go to a different school, like they don't know all the things. That, like, you know, who's that television character? I have no idea. Dan. Is there some sort of standardized formatting to encoding knowledge? People have tried to come up with standards. There's KIF, the knowledge interchange format. Um, there's OWL, the uh, web ontology language. Um, so, yeah, people have definitely thought about that. It seems useful, so you can... Absolutely, absolutely. Businesses, IBM was a, was, got really into knowledge representation at one point because um, they saw the web as the future, and if we can put all the information on the web in some annotated format where computers could understand what it meant, then computers could go off and, and, and uh, find the parts your business needed and find the cheapest supplier all automatically. 
Okay, this is actually a new laptop, so I have no idea how to use the virtual desktop feature on this particular computer, so I'm going to have to just stumble around. Uh, I think we're ready, to, cool. ready for class. Yeah? Second. How successful would that machine, uh, that, that system, that program be? Yeah. Oh. How go. successful would it be if you set it Sherlock Holmes? I mean, something less hard than Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, so... so um, a lot, of, a lot of the newer systems are, uh, there's an attempt to see how far you can go with um, machine learning and just feed a system a ton of text and have it learn how to understand English just from doing a lot of reading. Um, and those systems tend to have broader coverage, but they don't have as deep an understanding of stuff. That particular system, I have no idea how it would handle the Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, I assume the language in there is a little bit archaic, and it might even be hard to parse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's. Uh, I think it's extremely exciting. Um, uh, does that system? That system's called Boris. I don't think Boris has a Facebook page. Um, yeah. Um, so we have a bunch of end of lecture questions. Um, some about personal questions, like have I ever read the book Purely Functional Data Structures? And I've had, I have the book, and I've skimmed through it, but I can't say I've really deeply read it. But uh, it, I, from skimming it, it looks really cool. Um, uh, someone asked me if my award in dancing was from ballroom dance, and it was not. Uh, I, someone asked if I've ever read Good Lesher Bach, which is a very famous book. And I think I started it, but I just uh, had to put it down. Um, and then they asked about Steven Pinker, who I just idolize. He's totally awesome. Anything by Steven Pinker is worth reading in my book. Um, so uh, someone asked me my opinion of Cleverbot. And I have to admit, I wouldn't even have enough time to go look up Cleverbot. So I will do that for next class. That's my homework. Uh, how complicated is it relative to AI to write something that learns in a relatively general case? Well, you'll be writing some learning algorithms, two of them, actually, for assignments four and five. So you'll get a sense of how hard it is to write a learning algorithm, and how general are the learning algorithms we're going to be covering? Well, pretty darn general. Um, but uh, we'll see what you think, and I look forward to talking about that when we get there. Um, so you'll see. I think learning is part of AI, personally. So, um, We talked about the physical symbol system hypothesis last time. It's a mouthful, physical symbol system hypothesis. In order it was, a, it was a hypothesis by Newell and Simon saying that if you want general intelligent behavior, you need to have something that's equivalent to a physical symbol system. What's a physical symbol system? Anybody remember? Was it um, representations of things in physical space that is understood like? So it has to have symbols. And a symbol, what's a symbol? Representation of something else, right? Yeah, something that designates. Something that designates. There's an arrow going from the head to the world, into the world. A pointer, exactly. Yeah, you, what can you not solve in computer science by just adding more pointers? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a special kind of pointer that doesn't point to another memory location, but it points out into the world, which is pretty cool. Um, physical symbol system hypothesis. So what's we talked symbol, a thing that designates. What is a symbol system? System that, wait, there's another part besides just pointing out to the world. Yeah, oh, combinatorial. Yeah, one of my favorite words. Combinations, combinatorial. Oh, you can combine the symbols together to mean all kinds of crazy things. I can talk about green rhinoceroses with purple horns with a little star at the end. Even though you've never seen one, you never will see one, you've probably never heard anyone talk about them before in your entire life. But now, all of a sudden, you have in your head the image of a green rhinoceros with purple horns, and one of them, there's a little silver star at the end. Oh, my daughters would love that. It's almost as good as a unicorn. Or a pegasus. In fact, my daughters invented a pegacorn, which is a, a pegasus that's also a unicorn. So they're combining, see, they're combining symbols together to make new things. This is the joy of human creativity. That, like, that would not be possible if we didn't have symbols. Exactly. Well, my pet theory is imagination is pretty straightforward once you got the symbols down. Like taking a bunch of symbols and putting them together, like, 
bad. Now, do they mean something cool? That okay. That's the, that's that's a hard part. Yeah, Pegacorn. Yeah, you guys aren't good enough to generate Pegacorns. I'm sure. <laughs> no way. Uh, somebody asked. So a physical symbol system. It's a physical system, so it like actually exists, um, and it manipulates symbols. So so yeah, that's a necessary and sufficient for intelligent action. That's the premise of knowledge representation. We're going to have symbols. They're going to represent stuff. We're going to combine them together. They're going to mean things. That's what we're that's what we're doing. Someone asked in an end of lecture question: Are in in natural languages are words the smallest symbols or letters? Whew, anybody have thoughts about that? Yeah, exactly. And certain languages, like I think it's Finnish. Yeah. Finnish has apparently, I don't know anything about Finnish, but I think it's, I don't think it's Icelandic, I think it's Finnish, um, has incredible morphology. Like they string these morphemes together into these Mongo words whose meaning you can know if you know all the little blips. Um, in English, we have a fairly impoverished morphology. We put a lot more of the meaning of the sentence into the syntax. Um, uh, so I guess it depends on the language. But, but you can talk about the letter S. Yeah, that's a morpheme. That's a little like word unit suffix thing. That but, but when I think of S, I think of, or at least in this context, the symbol of, or, you know, the symbol pointing to. The oh, so now you're using S as a word. Word. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I think you have the idea. I think we're all, are we all on the same page. In different contexts. I mean, what's the, the fundamental combinable unit? Like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, an R is not a unit with an independent meaning. And if I say, you know, roar does not take its meaning from the fact that it has the two R's. Except maybe it might be a little bit from the sound. Like, roar! Like, uh, that does sound kind of R-ish. So maybe that's a bad example. <laughs> ah, OK. Um, most, so well, this starts with a bold claim, this, this supposed question. The students, this starting with a bold, most of the historical advances in logic were improvements to encoding schemes. This is a claim. This is a proposition. What do we know about propositional <coughs> logic? Proposition is something that, what's a proposition? Exactly. So here's a proposition. Most of the historical advances in logic were improvements to encoding schemes. Hmm. Most. That most. That means if we, if we take the historical advances larger than larger than fifty percent, will be improvements to encoding schemes. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. The thing is that it's like very easy to invent new logics. But to have to convince other people that they're cool enough that they would actually use them, it's kind of like uh, programming languages. Like how many programming languages have been used by someone other than the person who invented the language, right? Like you know, then you know it's good because it catches on and other people see value in it. Um, so so I don't know. I think that's kind of a controversial statement. Um, certainly, first order logic is a fantastic improvement over propositional logic, as I hope we'll see by the end of today. Do you think there will be important advances in AI that come from improved encodings rather than improved manipulation of current encodings? And I can't tell you the number of papers that get published at the annual AI conference where someone has come up with a new encoding for blah 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 that makes things faster and better and smaller. And so there certainly are a lot of advances in that front. Um, and I don't even do knowledge representation. It's already clear to me. So. But it's pretty rare. Propositional logic is only NP complete, but like even just first order logic is already semi decidable, uh, which, as we'll either talk about at the end of today or probably more likely on Wednesday, is like already really bad. Like reasoning with first order logic is really hard to do efficiently. So um, usually people stay like in the simplest possible logic, and like propositional logic, for example, actually sees a lot of use in AI, as much as I rag on it for being a hardware kind of ECE level thing. Um, we use it a lot in, in AI, so that's because it's more it's fairly straightforward to reason with. 
Is all logic that programs handle typically in CNF form? Well, if by programs you mean assignment two, yes, all the, all the logic that your program will see is in CNF. Now, does logic, does logic in the wild occur in CNF? Not necessarily. It occurs in whatever it occurs in. Um, but I think we talked last time about why DNF is really boring. Um, does anyone remember why DNF is like the most boring form of, most boring way to write down uh, logic? I don't, yeah, maybe we didn't talk about this. OK. Um, now, if I don't have virtual desktops, how do I easily, I think I'm just going to have to just manually go back and forth. Um, so before, you remember we had some CNF before. We, did, we worked on the, the unicorn example. And this was the knowledge base we came up with here. And this is in CNF. And each of these things is true. Supposedly, I mean, if the, if, the, if the agent believes what's written in its knowledge base, let's focus this a little bit. Um, if the agent believes what's in its knowledge base, then it believes that all of these things are true. This is a giant conjunction. These are each individual formulas, but the, the knowledge base consists of their conjunction together. There's a giant implicit and around all of them. Not mythical or immortal, mythical or not immortal, mythical or mammal, not immortal or horned. Not mammal or horned, and not horned or magical. Um, the, an agent that believes all these things um, knows all these different things are true. Uh, CNF. So if you write something down in DNF, you have a giant and, a giant or of ands. So you know that this thing is true, or this thing is true, or this thing is true. Or this thing is true. Now, why is that just not as convenient to form? If you want to use the bonus points, if you use the word combinatorial in your answer. In CNF, the agent knows that one of these things is true, and one of these things is going to be true, and one of these things is going to be true. Any state of the world has to, that's, that's possible satisfies each of these statements, and they're all ors. So we know that one of these literals is true about the world. So it's a very concise way to write down the set of possible worlds. Because usually in the world, things are fairly independent. Like the fact that I either have my brown pants or my cocky pants on the chair in my bedroom right now is like totally independent from what I'm doing here in Kingsbury. And so it's really nice to be able to write that down as an independent fact that's true. Whereas if this were in CNF, we'd have to say, well, this is true, and 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 this is true, or this is true, and 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 this is true, or this is true, and that's 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 true. We'd have to enumerate all the possible worlds of which there are going to be exponentially many in the number of formulas in the CNF representation. This is the CNF. In the, C, the, in the DNF representation, we'd have to write down all the combinations. Yeah, I'm sorry. Perhaps I misspoke. Um, but so CNF is a really nice, concise, intuitive representation to have. So that's why we love it so. Uh, OK, any more questions before we get started? We're missing a bunch of people today. I wonder what's up. It's Monday. That's <coughs> Monday. I think I'm not making the assignments due frequently enough. I think we need a new assignment 1.5 next year. Oh, 